Um, so you're all encouraged to follow along with me. Uh, if you're using the VM, Git's already installed. As a matter of fact, if you're using almost any Linux system, Git's probably going to be installed. If not, you can install it by running, you know, package manager of your choice, install git or whatever. So sudo apt git install git. Sudo apt get install git. Um, but it's already installed here. The git command is just git all by itself. If you run it, you'll get the help message because that's not actually, you never run just the word git. It's always git followed by some command. Uh, and because we want to actually do some useful things with it, let's go ahead and Git kind of works on the basis of you, you put all of your, you have like a directory, the top level directory for your project. So I mean, this is probably how you organize your code already, right? You start a new project, you stick it all in a folder. That's what you want to do with Git. So we need to start with essentially a folder. Git doesn't control everything on your system. Instead, you point it at specific folders called repositories in this case. Um, so we'll start by making a new folder. So I'll just call mine my project, right? Whatever. Who cares? And I'm going to go into that folder. And right now, this is just an empty folder. So this would be the model you would follow if you were starting a new project. Uh, you can actually, you can, a lot of these steps will work if you already have a project full of code that isn't being used with Git right now, you can actually do the same thing. So it really doesn't matter that this is an empty folder. But the first thing you want to do when you're starting a project, you do it before you create files, or if you already have existing files, you can just go ahead and do it, is what we call, we need to basically turn this from a regular directory into a Git repository. So right now, it's, it's nothing. If I do git status, so git status is basically the command that just tells you what's going on with git in time. We'll get this fatal error, not a git repository, so on and so forth, right? So right now, it's just a regular directory. Git doesn't know anything about it. We're not, it's not under version control, anything like that. So the first step to place a directory under version control is you need to run the git init command. So this is git space init. And if we run that, it'll go ahead and say initialized empty git repository and home a sailor my project. So I can do an ls, the folder is still empty. If I actually do an ls-al, I will see one thing different now. This folder has a .git directory in it. Uh, git, like many things in Linux, basically all of its control files, all of the data associated with git, is going to be stored just in regular files inside this .git directory. So you guys will never need to touch this. You can pretend it's not there. That's why it has the dot in front of it. That's why it doesn't show up when you just run regular ls. It's essentially a hidden folder. But behind the scenes, all the magic gets doing, it's essentially storing in files inside this folder. Sometimes you'll like extract a zip file and it'll have this .git in it. That actually means that whoever zipped up that file was using git. And you can actually benefit from that. If this is already there, I mean, again, there's no more magic. It's not like there's extra stuff stored elsewhere on the system. It's all self-contained. So if you extract a zip file that has a .git in it, you actually have access to all of the git history, to all of the existing version control for whoever sent you that zip file. Um, this can be good and bad. I mean, this is good if you want to get some of that functionality. It can also be a leak if you know you don't want whoever you're sending your zip file to to be able to see every one change, every individual change you made, or be able to see the old version of the code before the version you're sending to them. So take it as a caveat. If you're going to send this directory to someone now and you don't want them to have the git, make sure you copy it and delete the .git before you zip it up and send it to them. Or if you do want them to have it, just zip it up as is and, uh, and it's all there. But realize it's an additional, essentially some additional data you're exposing. So now if we repeat that git status command again, We'll see, we have, uh, no longer have an error. We have a little bit of data now. It's telling us something. It says on branch master. We'll talk about what that means. It then says initial commit. It also says nothing to commit, so on and so forth. Get add to track. So it's essentially working, but it's saying there aren't any files here for me to be tracking. So let's go ahead and make a file. Um, so, you know, text editor of your choice. I'm just going to call this file one. And uh, you know what actually would be an even better thing to do? Also, as good practice, like using Git, is every time you start a coding project, you should have a readme in the top level directory. This is just when someone starts looking at your code, it's kind of the overall who wrote it, who's it by, where do they go for more help, what's the basic structure, a one sense on what it does, you know, the core things someone looking at your code need to know to figure out what's going on. So let's do that. I'm going to create a file called readme. It's almost always that's standard. Whenever you have these kind of text files, you make them all capitalized, you don't give a file extension. So I'm going to say this is a git test project. It's by Andy Saylor. You can contact me at andysaylor.com. Mm -hmm. 
So there's nothing special about the fact this is a readme file, it's just good practice. I mean, this could be any file name or whatever you want it. Uh, and then I'm just going to put a, this is a project to demonstrate using get with lots of misspellings. All right, so I'm going to save this. I'm going to close Emacs. So I now have these two files. I'm actually going to remove that first one I created. So I just have this readme file. Now if I go to get status, I'm going to get a little bit more info. It now says you have untracked files, namely readme. So just because we put this directory under git, it's now a git version control directory, doesn't mean that git automatically adds everything in it. In fact, git will never automatically add something. Git's always going to you, and when you create a new file, you have to always add it to get the first time. So you can actually have files in this directory that Git's not tracking. So what we want to do is we want Git to start tracking README, so that every time we change README, Git keeps track of those changes. So the command to do that, anytime you want to add a file to have Git move it from the untracked list to the tracked list, the command's git add. So we're going to do git add README. We're going to run git status again. So you don't have to run git status between everything. I'm just doing it to demonstrate the different states, right? Obviously, you run git status whenever you want an update. If you can keep track of all the stuff in your head, all the merrier. So now we've gone a little further. We've said changes to be committed. So it's no longer an untracked file, but there's now a change to be committed to new file readme. So in a version control system, a lot of this terminology is true for Git, true for other things. We have what's called a commit, where a commit's basically a moment in time where you say, save the current state. So those are where you can roll back to, right? They're the, they're the uh, kind of granules of changes that you demarcate within the version control system. So when we actually, we haven't done a commit yet, hence the to be committed, right? This commit hasn't happened, but it's saying when we commit, this is what's going to happen. It's going to save the fact that it has this new file. Questions? Feel free to interrupt me if I lose anyone throughout here. So we have this new file, it's added, so it's what we currently call staged right now. Staged are changes that you've added, but not yet committed. So it basically goes from untracked to staged to committed. And we're at the staged point right now. So let's go ahead and actually do the commit. As you might imagine, the command is commit. And you can just run it as is. If you do, Git's gonna pop up in a text editor. Git requires every commit to have what's called a commit message. This is essentially just a note. You can do whatever you want. The right way to use it is it should be a note reflecting all of the changes in this commit since the last one. When you go through the log of all your changes, this is how you're going to remember, oh, that's the one I want to roll back to because that's where I added the feature that I think is causing the bug, or that's the one I want to roll back to because of this or that. Uh, so you can actually write whatever you want. I'm going to write uh, this. The only thing here is I just added basic readme. And it's going to open up, this is nano by default that it opened up. Um, so it's just a very basic text editor, all the commands you need are down here at the bottom. So I'm just going to type in added basic readme. It's just telling me control X is what exits. So I'm going to do a control X. It's going to say save, I'm going to say yes. And just keep the name the same, Git knows that that's what it's supposed to be. And now if I do a git status, we'll see we're back to nothing to commit. So we now have, we created one file, we committed it. It's now saved essentially in the, ver in, in the Git version history. If we go to Git log, we can see that commit we just did. So Git log assigns each commit this unique ID. This is just, you know, a hash essentially that identifies the commit. This is what you would use if you need to like compare two commits, we'll get to that later. It gives you the author. Um, that's all fine and dandy, and it tells you the date of the commit, obviously, and then the string that I have a note that I made with the commit, right? Added basic readme. Questions on what just happened? Or what's going on? Or anything like that? All right, so we now have one file. It's inside Git, and we've committed it. So our change is essentially saved. We could roll back to this point from any future change now. So let's say, let's go into readme again. So I'm going to go to README, and I'm going to add another line, and then I'm going to exit. If I run git status again, we'll see, all right, it's recognizing the fact that README has been modified. It's saying this has not yet been staged for commit, so I made a change, but I haven't told it I want to save that change. Um, and there's a number of things I can do now. 
So I could go ahead and commit that most recent change, so essentially save it as well. I could decide that that's changed with something I didn't want, right? So I could roll back to my previous commit. Um, I could also just keep making edits, right? I could edit more files, I could create new files. In general, it's good practice to commit as frequently as possible, right? There's no rule though. You can commit whenever you want. If this were a programming assignment, you'd probably commit every time you added a new feature, right? Or it did some new basic granularity of work. You wouldn't commit every time you had a word. You wouldn't want to commit just one time when you're done with the entire project, because it would kind of defeat the purpose. Um, but if you commit regularly at logical points, it makes it easier to roll back. So we're going to actually say, let's say I didn't want that change. I want to throw away that change I just made. So Git's actually really good at giving you hints about things you might want to do. That's when you do this git status, it's saying, well, if you want to do something, so if I want to commit this file, I need to do git add file name like we did before. Uh, if I want to revert the file, I can do git check out this file. Um, and then down here at the bottom, I can do the business and other things I can do. So let's go ahead and uh, let's discard all those changes. Let's revert. So I'm going to do git checkout, uh, just like it's telling me. So git checkout followed by the file name. So the file name in this case is readme. This checkout command can do a lot of different things. When I do it like this on a file that I haven't, that has changes I haven't committed, this is going to roll me back to the most recent commit. I only have one commit, so that's really all I could do right now. But if I had multiple commits, you can also specify which commit you want to roll back to here. So I could say, go back to this point in time, or go back to this point in time. But as is, it's just going to roll back to my previous commit, which is essentially without my most recent line. So I'm going to do that. Uh, let's look back at the readme file now. And we'll notice that line I added has disappeared. Right? It essentially rolled me back to the most recent commit. Questions? Okay, so let's add another line again. This time I'm actually going to save it. Okay, so we're back right where we were before, but this time instead of rolling back, let's say I actually want to commit that change. So there's two ways I can commit that change. There's what we did before, where essentially I'm going to do a git add readme. And then if I go to git status, it'll say stage for commit, and then I can do git commit. Kind of interesting one thing at a time here. So we did git commit before we left this out. It popped up a text editor and we had to type in our comment. That's kind of a pain in the ass because it requires an extra screen. The dash m allows you to uh, basically make a comment right with the commit message. So the m stands for message. But um, this will avoid me having to pop up a text editor. So if I just type in whatever my basically commit message, so my note to myself, so this would be I added a line of text to read me. Cool. So if I do that, it didn't pop up that TED that it didn't pop up the um, editor this time. Instead, it just made the commit. If I do git log, I'll now see both of those commits in reverse order. So this is my first commit. Now this is my second commit. Questions? So you guys, if this is the first time you've really used Git, are probably going to get this little message that it spit out when I did the commit. That's basically a warning. When you do a Git commit, it basically stamps it with your name and email address. What this is telling me is I've never told it what my name and email address is. There's nothing really wrong with this. It's not broken. However, it is going to break some things when I start to do, or not really break, but when I start to do collaboration, this is going to be annoying. Um, so we're going to fix this here in a sec. Why would you add readme a second time after you modified it? So the add it needs to happen. In, in Git, you need to stage. The add is not just for new files. Mm -hmm. Add is basically making a list. You need to add anything that you want to be included in your commit. So because I changed readme, I needed to add readme again, telling it that the changes in readme I want to include in the next commit. This seems kind of silly to just have one file, but if we have five files and say I want to split it out, so like I made a bunch of changes without committing and I want three of the files to be in one commit, two of the files to be in a separate commit, I would add those three files, do a commit. It wouldn't affect the other two files. I would then add those two files and do a second commit. So by do the add, adding and committing are separate. Add stages something for commit, right? You can basically do adds over and over again that makes a list of everything and then a commit flushes that whole list and saves it. Does that make sense? Um, the point you bring up, which, so 
you are right, it's annoying to have to add files every time, so there's actually shorthand. If you just want to automatically commit everything that's changed except new files, you can do a git commit, dash a. So the dash a means skip the add stage and just automatically add everything I've changed that doesn't. So dash a will include new files, but if you have files that it's already tracking that you just made changes to, the dash a will add all of those. So we can demo that in a second. And then you can do the dash a on it again, so on and so forth. So if I know I just need to do, I want every all of my changes to be in one commit, I just do a git commit dash a dash m and I skip the add step. You can also do a git add dash u. The dash u means automatically add everything that's changed. So this would avoid me having to list if I change multiple files, I wouldn't have to list them each here. So there's shorthands in place to kind of make this process faster. Um, but the fine, I mean, keeping it simple for now, the add gives you that fine grained control to kind of select a subset of your changes to be in a commit instead of forcing you to commit everything to change. Okay, let's get back real quick. Uh, again, we're getting this little warning message right now because we've never added these. So if you're getting these as well, you should do what I'm about to do. If not, you're all set. Um, in general, like, when you like push something to GitHub, which we'll get to later, it uses the email address you put here to associate your work with like your author on GitHub. So it's important that whatever email address you use here is also an email address GitHub's aware of. You can add multiple email addresses to GitHub, so it's not that big of a deal. But note that if you realize you're committing things to GitHub and you can't like click on your name next to them, that's because GitHub doesn't know. It generally means your email address isn't right. So Git is being good about telling us exactly what's wrong. It's saying the name and email address were configured automatically. Please check they're accurate. And then it's saying basically go through and run these commands to add them manually. So I'm going to go ahead and run these commands. Obviously, my name's not your name. It's Andy Saylor. You guys will put your own name here. I'm going to do the same thing with the email address command. Oh, I and now I won't get those messages anymore. You can always check what these global variables, so these are essentially like Git configuration variables. You can check what they're set up by just running them with no arguments. So if I run that, it'll tell me what the current user.name is, and if I want to see what the current email on file is, I can do that. So you only need to do this once, like, on the entire system. This is a new computer, which is the only reason it hasn't been done for me. But once you do this once, any Git things I touch on this computer, it's going to associate to stamp with that name and that email. There's nothing critical to Git's functionality about it. It's really just it makes it helpful, like I said, when you start to collaborate. Um, but uh, it also makes it easier for things like GitHub to affiliate that. Questions? OK, so let's go into a little more detail. Uh, let's make another file. So I'm going to create a new file, or I'm going to create a couple of new files. So file one. So if I do a git status now, we'll see I have two new untracked files. So because they're new files, I, I do actually have to add them. So the one time you absolutely have to use an add is when you have new files. Uh, so if I do git commit dash a, it's not going to add them automatically. Um, so let's do git add. File star. So if I do get status now, it knows about both of those. I'm going to go ahead and commit that. So git commit dash m, and I'm going to say added two new files. OK. So now we're back to it's saying working directory clean. So whenever it says you're working directory clean, it basically means you have no uncommitted changes, right? It means you're on the most recent commit, nothing's changed. 